What is going on, you guys? This is the Triple Thrift Podcast. We are your three hosts. My name is Drew with Profit Monsters, and I am here with my best friends, Joey Bada Bing 22 and Josh, also known as Harry Tornado, on YouTube. And we get together every week, sometimes multiple times a week, to talk about reselling, thrifting, YouTube, life, and the friendship and brotherhood that we have created between the three of us. And uh, I'm just really excited to be here. It is currently 9.08 a.m. I was up till 3 a.m., almost 3.30 a.m. doing listings because I picked up a bunch of video game stuff and I just couldn't stop listing it because I knew it would sell fast. So I was listing last night. Uh, but before we get too deep into this conversation of whatever we talk about today, cause it's always off the cuff and unplanned, Joey and Josh, why don't you say hi to the people and tell them how your week has been. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Um, I'm super excited. Uh, yesterday was my last day of work. Um, and I have vacation, so I'm off for 12 days and I'm super pumped. I'm a full-time reseller for 12 days and I'm ready to go, baby. Let's go, baby. Uh, t- right after. Right after this podcast, I'm going to start inventorying all my stuff. Like I have it where I know where everything is, but I'm going to put it in bins that I got for my birthday in January. And it's already like, what, February 17th or 18th or something like that. Um, but but yeah, I- I'm super pumped. I'm going to get everything organized, ready to go for potentially going full time in the future. I want to set it up to where I am where I could just fall right into this and have everything ready to go. I don't want to be that person that, you know, just jumps into it blind and doesn't know what's going on. I bought hustle and hook spreadsheet and I'm going to go full blast and just get it all situated. And I'm super pumped for the next 12 days. So, so yeah. What about you, Josh? So you haven't used your bins yet that you got, uh, for your birthday? <laughs> no. So how are no. you how are you currently storing your stuff? <laughs> so I have my old um like bedroom mm-hmm. set with drawers and I I just like store all my stuff in there which is it's yeah. working for now, you know, but eventually when I do go bigger, I'm going to have to start using something yeah. else, you know? So um they ha- it, it is big drawers, but it's just it's not going to do for now, you know. I I got to I got to transition over and this is the best time to do it while I have yeah, time. Yeah, 100%. You know? Yes, sir. 100%. Uh, so so my week's been good. I uh, we, we I uploaded the third um, installment of my starting from zero challenge. And that thing is going, at least in the third week, it was going really, really well. I picked up a really nice video game bundle on Facebook from this super country guy. I don't know if you guys have seen the video yet, but that guy's, his accent was just it. killing me. <laughs> Uh, but all that sold super fast. And I wanted to kind of use that as an example because I got a um, an Instagram message from this guy and said he's been he and his wife have started listing on eBay over the last couple months. And they heard that, you know, if you list every day, you know, three, four five items a day, it should increase sales. And he's like, you know, we've been doing that for two or three weeks now. We've been listing every single day at least three items and we've only we're only getting like one sale per week. And so he sent me his eBay store and a lot of people <laughs> want me to review their eBay stores, but uh, I, I can't do everybody because I would just be doing it all day long. But this one, I, I just felt like I should look at it. And um, I did. And it was his pictures were fine. His prices were fine. But the items that they were selling was like, you know, like a Garth Brooks cassette tape and a Minnie Mouse keychain and some book mm-hmm. for like three ninety nine or something like that. And they're just like working so hard, like thrifting these items and cleaning them and listing them. And then they're not selling and they think they're doing something wrong. When in fact, the only thing wrong is the item. Like, I'm like, dude, your problem is that you're, you're killing yourself listing all these items that just aren't going to sell. Like if you look up Garth Brooks cassette tape, how many have actually sold on eBay in the last, this one, this particular eBay, the, the item, you know, how many are actually selling? Uh, and he hasn't responded yet, but I'm assuming that if he looked it up, it might have, you know, one or two sold in the last 90 days with maybe 50 listed. So if you get into eBay and you're, you feel like you're listing a lot, but you're not getting sales, check your items. I think a lot of people just get really excited when they first start thrifting and they're like, oh, this I can get for 50 cents and sell for $3 and turn a dollar into $8. And um, I, I almost feel guilty because I do buy small items like that, especially at the bins. I'll buy something for 
you know, 50 cents I could sell for 15, but not that I can sell on eBay. Like stuff like that is like most of the time those sell to viewers. Like in my last uh, video with Haley, when we went to the bins, I picked up those two tumblers, like the Coke tumbler and the Texas Longhorn Turvis tumbler. Um, I would never list something like that on eBay because yeah. it would sell for 15 bucks free shipping after fees is not worth my time. But both of those sold to viewers because viewers are constantly wanting to, you know, support the channel and buy and buy something. So I like to keep those smaller priced items in my store so they can, you know, easy, easy to find something like when we do the live listing and your winners, we go through their eBay store. I'll be honest. I always look for this, the cheapest items first, you know, so I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to list only $50 items because people that want to support the store, I don't want them to have to buy something for 50 bucks. You know, I'm like, Hey, how about this cup? 12 bucks free shipping, right, you know? Right. So, uh, so I do that, but just, just because I have, I've been blessed with the audience that I have. If I, if you don't have an audience like that, you really need to stay away from those smaller items because it's, it's just not going to work out for you. I don't want you to be killing yourself listing this stuff um, and thinking you're doing something wrong when in reality, it's not your fault. It's the item. Item's just not desirable. And also could be with the price as well. If you have it priced too high, it's never going to sell. If there's yeah. 50, you know, just saying if there's 50 listing and you have it up for $25 when they're only selling for like five, you know, you're never yeah. going to sell that. So you, you really have to take a look. And even at that some well. things like honestly, something, even if you had it for free, like some things, nobody just, just nobody wants it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things with eBay that, especially when it comes to listing, I think it's very important, especially for new sellers. You know, if I, I should, I was thinking about making a video about this, but I didn't know how to do it. But like, five things I wish I knew when I first started on eBay or something like that. But I wanted to do it differently than the typical, you know, like, here's five tips for eBay sellers, you know, or the the seven deadly sins of reselling, you know. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, one of the things is, is sell through rate. And you kind of mentioned it right there, Josh, but I think it's super important for resellers to understand sell through rate because you can buy something and if you look at just what's listed and you see that there's a bunch listed for a hundred dollars two hundred dollars whatever but then there's none selling for that much you know there's a big difference between what people are asking for something and what they actually sell for um but before i get too deep into that i just wanted to mention too because it was cracking me up and i just thought about it Josh was talking about, um, you were saying that, you know, you won't, you normally don't buy stuff at the bins for 50 cents to sell for, you know, 10 or 15 bucks. And in your video with Haley, you were at the bins and you like look at a baseball bat and you're like, yeah, so this baseball bat will probably cost me about like a dollar or two. And I could probably sell for like 20 bucks plus shipping. So I think I'm going to leave that. And then the next clip is here's this dirty, dirty tailor made hat. I could probably sell this for 15 bucks, but I'm going to have to give it a good scrub. I'm like, what? So I was, okay, I was cracking okay, up. Let me explain. Because it just goes, well, it just goes to show that people like to sell things that they like to sell because I would never pick yeah. up a tailor-made golf hat because I haven't had luck with tailor-made anything. I haven't had luck with golf anything. Mm -hmm. But you love golf stuff and Joey loves hats. So I knew that both of you guys would have picked up that hat, you know, and then, <laughs> you course. know, but I would have I would have totally left that hat at the bins uh, because now something maybe when I very first started, I would have picked it up, tried to oxy it and clean it, um, tried to oxy it and clean it. But now I would never. Uh, and I know the point of picking up that hat was because you were going to oxy it, you were going to clean it and you know, so that way you could see how clean it is. And yes, I see that you just put it on and it is looking super crispy. So I know you were doing it. Dude, to see I'm how telling you. Clean it could come out. Okay. This thing, I, I don't know if we're going to upload the video aspect to this YouTube, but the Taylor made hat, go watch my video. That thing was filthy, like absolutely just, it's a white hat. So, I mean, you could tell people and with the golf, you're constantly like sweating and like taking your hat on and off. So there's like, Usually if you're right-handed, the right-hand side of the bill is always really dirty. And this was just covered in dirt. But I knew that probably just soaking it in OxyClean would get it would get it clean. And something like this in my store would sell super fast. Like it's in a video. I showed on Instagram how I cleaned it. 
I could probably sell it for 20 bucks free shipping. You know, and it wasn't actually like I didn't sit there and scrub it. I literally just filled up my bathtub with oxyclean and water right. and threw it in there. Um, the baseball bat, I don't know if you remember the video, but it there was like three listed for like 15 to $18 plus shipping, but none sold. And I know we're getting in like coming out of the last 90 days isn't quite baseball season, but for an item like that, I don't know, you have to box it up in the triangle box and I did, and that's not something that would really sell to a viewer. You know, it's a baseball bat that would have to usually, I don't think I've ever sold a baseball bat mm -hmm. to a viewer. Um, so th that's something again, that's specific to me. And like, I know I, I was confident right. I could clean this hat and I was confident that once it was clean, it would sell super fast. I'll list this today and it'll probably sell within 24 hours. Um, I mean, it's perfect. Yeah. perfect. Well, I think, I think, and that's the, the joy of being a, a reseller is, you know, for the most part, you have the freedom to pick up and list and sell whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to pick up Garth Brooks cassette tapes, go for it. But if the sell through rate, you know, or the solds aren't there, then, you know, that's something to obviously keep, keep, keep your mind aware of, you know, and I've learned a lot from watching other people. I think that's, you know, like I was saying, if I could go back and tell other myself things I wish I would have known when I first started, the first one would have been watch other YouTubers and learn a lot more before you jump right in. When I first found out about the bins, yeah. I got so hyped on the bins that I was just going and finding stuff and I wasn't even thinking about sell through rate or what it's worth. I was just like, ooh, a Nike t-shirt. Ooh, a Columbia sweater. Ooh, a Nickelodeon, you know, t-shirt or, you know, whatever. It's also and cheap. I didn't know anything. It's only $2. Exactly. So it's basically free. Ex yeah, exactly. So I figured at the time, well, any anything, when you're first starting, anything you can resell is, is worth the pickup for the most part. But the sell-through rate makes a huge factor between, I think, the first 90 days of somebody's reselling business or their career when they start reselling the first 90 days is so important because it'll make or break you as a reseller. If you start listing and you get a hundred or 200 listings in the first 90 days, and then you realize, Hey, I'm not selling anything. You're going to get discouraged and you're going to quit and you're going to be like, this is fake. Nobody can do this. It's not possible. But then when you start watching other people, like when I found out about Renzi, I know I use them as examples a lot, but they're just a perfect example. When I found mm -hmm. out about them, I was like, I can't believe how many people buy used worn shoes on eBay and Poshmark. And then I started picking them up. And then I was blown away by how much money you can get, especially for br certain brands. I shared on my Instagram the other day, I sold a, picked up a pair of Hoka Clifton's at the bins for literally like two bucks. And they were worn beat to crud on the bottom. And I still sold them for $60 plus shipping. And I don't even understand. They probably have like a couple miles left of tread on them. You walk around the track one time and they're, you throw them away. Joey, what do you think about all that? Like, like something that is worth like nothing and you sell for a lot. Scammer. No, just like, just like the whole aspect of because you're probably the newest reseller out of the three of us. So, you know, picking up stuff, how often are you looking at sell through rate now versus, you know, what have you changed? I guess you could say since you started reselling to where you're at now, you know, obviously we were talking on the phone yesterday and you were like looking at the pots and pans section. Nobody was looking at pots and pans until Hustlin' Hooks was talking about it, you know, so obviously we right. all make shifts and changes in our business, but how has that been for you? Cause I know you, you know, I, you still pick up as many hats as you used to like those kinds of things. Um, like yesterday I picked up a cowboy hat, you know, like I, I still think that there's money to be made in hats, like, but you have to find the right ones. Like now I'm really picky with, mm -hmm. with what I, with what I pick up. Um, I really look at the sell through rate. You have to, they're, they're just, there's no reason to pick something up. That's not worth it. You know, I'm wasting, you're wasting your money, but then it might not sell for a year or six months. You have to pay attention to the sell through rate. I tell it to my girl all the time. She, she's calling me in the thrift store and she's like, Joey, is this good to pick up? Well, Des, look at the comps. I, I can't tell you you're looking at it. You see the condition. 
you know, that's another thing, a condition of the item. You say, you know, Drew picks up those shoes and they only have one mile or two miles of tread left. Look and see if the tread is there. Look and see if there's wear and tear or whatever. You have to pay attention to those things because if you're going full time, you know, you have to like in my in my thought process, you have to pay attention because if you're wasting your money, you're really going to be wasting your money. Like you have to yeah. pay attention. There's no, you know, you know, I got bills to pay, you know, and so do other people, you know? Um, so pay attention to those things. That's what I've been paying attention to is the sell through rate. I just picked up this like little troll looking guy. Um, it's called like the, it's called the grunt mm -hmm. with a D the grunt. And it's like this little troll guy and the sell through rate is it's okay. There was 11 sold in the last 90 days, but the ones that are listed have like this little troll guy, but mine has yeah. the box with it. So mine might sell first before any of them because they want the box or, you know, something like that. And those are the little things that you have to look for when you pick up items like that. Um, I will so, say yeah. that like, <laughs> Like you, you, you said you looked up sold comps on, on hats and stuff. Now for me, I, I think I said in that video too, when I got that Coke tumbler, like sometimes I don't look up sold comps. I just think something's cool. Like if I think it's cool, chances are mm -hmm. somebody else will think it's cool. But I want to clarify that, that that's right. just because I have my YouTube channel. Like if you're starting out reselling without right. following, you can't buy stuff that you think is cool and just hope somebody else will think it cool. It's cool because there's just a huge difference between selling on eBay without than a social media following and selling on media with a social media following. So with hats, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, you're, you're almost, you're almost thrifting for your viewers at some Yeah, It's kind of like me, like crazy lamp lady, the same thing. Like, like could, you could probably make a whole video. You could probably make a whole video just calling it thrifting for my viewers yeah. and finding stuff and going, my viewers would probably like this, you know, and I, you just pick it up and, and you sell on Instagram too. Sell, like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's just part of like, you know, the business, like if you spend time making videos and building an audience and that's like one of the perks that comes along with it, um, like Crazy Lamp Lady picks up a lot of like glass and vases and stuff. And I'm pretty sure she sells everything like on her eBay store, maybe, but she starts out an auction and I bet she probably sells 80 percent of her stuff to viewers. And that's not bad. That, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Like, it's awesome. She's a huge YouTube channel, like over 150,000 subs. Um, that's just what happens. But if you get into it, like. Joey, yeah, I think you saw like Nurse Flipper sell some glass thing for like a couple hundred bucks. And you're like, I see glass stuff all the time. Let me just yeah. pick up some random <laughs> glass thing without looking up comps. And it's just <laughs> sometimes it's not the same. But uh, but yeah, with hats, I, I don't remember the last time I looked up a sold comp yeah. on a hat. I just see one. And I'm like, oh, tailor made. That'll get cleaned up and sold to, you know, even it might not sell to viewers. I think with viewer sales too, some people think that, oh, Harry Tornado sells more than half his stuff to viewers. But that's it doesn't mean that that item wouldn't sell to someone who wasn't a viewer. Sometimes viewers just buy stuff fast, you know, like I can list right. a N64. Yeah, it just means it'll, yeah. sell, it'll just sell faster. Yeah, I can list a, an N64. I've had I had an N64 in my death pile and I probably had five people message me about it wanting to buy it. And I'm like, oh, I'm just going to list it on eBay eventually because I just I wanted I wanted to list it. And I listed it and it sold to a regular person, not a viewer in like two days. So viewer sales don't mean that I'm selling stuff mm -hmm. that wouldn't sell it just means that it's selling faster and then it's easier i don't look up sold comps and stuff like that this is mm -hmm. this is why i love reselling in general is just the fact that all three of us can talk about this and we can all agree on certain points for example sell through rate but then we can also talk about how much you know i love picking up guitar hero and rock band and josh would just walk right past it you know at a thrift store <laughs> for the most part in his last video he picked up some stuff but um wait so josh you you picked up or you had the rock band set so did you ship that out not yet i have to ship it today it's sold on facebook so facebook has like a three or four day window for shipping and i've just been really procrastinating <laughs> so he's been about putting it. it on the back burner <laughs> it has the original box <laughs> so. just watch my watch my youtube video okay. on how to ship a rock band set. okay so my problem is like I have the I have the original box, so I, I feel like everything should fit in there. But the guitar doesn't. Does a guitar come like taken apart when you buy the rock band? Because it's it's like the the Fender Stratocaster, so it doesn't have the little switch in the back to take the neck off. No, I think that's stationary. I think I think the top part, um, the top part. I don't know guitar part names like the actual names, but where you would actually make the adjustments to tune it on a real guitar, that little headpiece. 
does come off. You can, there's normally a little button. It's very hard to see. There's a round button and it should slide off and then it would fit in the box. Okay. I'll figure it so, out. So, but I, I was check, confused because that, that. that's like, that's, that's the guitar that comes with the set. Like it has the drums and the, the fender, but even putting mm -hmm. it in like sideways, like diagonal to, to like make like the, the longest length. Um, yeah, that one. I have one actually right here. You guys can't see <laughs> Joe and Josh right here in between the screws. There's a little button and you push this button and then it slides off like that. And okay. then it should, oh, okay. and then it awesome. should fit. So awesome. Now you're I feel welcome. better. I need to get but, that shipped out today. But um, <laughs> like I was saying, that's, I the joys, that's the joys of reselling is that we can all talk about this and then we can share things that we like to sell, things we don't like to sell and what works for us and what doesn't. You know, I've got over 1600 active listings and I... I was telling Joey the other day, it's not always about how many active listings you have. I get people that DM me on Instagram all the time and they're like, how many active listings do you have to have to make $1,500 net profit a month? I'm like, you could sell one item for $2,000 and net $1,500 if you pick the right item. So mm -hmm. I can't give you that information or you could sell 150, you know, $10 items if that's the right math. Yeah. 150 $10 items. That's yeah, $1,500 so. in sales. So it depends on what kind of work you want to put in. But overall, I think one of the things that I wanted to share with our audience that I've learned with reselling since I've started is I am a major cheapskate. Like all my friends for the past, you know, 15 years, you know, always, you know, made fun of me and said, Drew, you're so cheap. You're so Jewish. I always use coupons whenever we used to go out and do stuff like we go to Top Golf or Dave and Buster's. I'd find a coupon, you know, buy one, get one free or half off or something. And uh, but now, you know, when I first started reselling, I was super cheap. I was trying to find stuff for a dollar. You know, now one of my biggest assets that I use is that I'm not afraid to pay up for stuff that I know I can make money on. Um, and one of those examples is yesterday I bought a Nintendo Wii bundle on Facebook Marketplace for $75. And most people would be like, $75? There's no profit in that. But if you go look at the bundle that I got, it came with like this um, this Wii Play Motion uh, box with the original controller. It's still sealed. And that has sold comps for $70 oh, wow. to $80 by itself. And then there's, there's a Wii, a Wii Fit board. There's like um, a GoldenEye. Um, James Bond, GoldenEye, Golden Wii controller, uh, and a bunch of other stuff, a Super Mario game. And so I, se I separated it into like five different listings and I should be able to, to make around $250 to $300, about $300 in gross sales from all of it. So if you can buy something wow. for $75, only have to do four or five listings and make $300 in sales versus buying 30 $10 hats from the bins. Yeah, you may have only spent eight bucks at the bins for all those hats, but the amount of work and effort mm -hmm. you have to do versus the sell through rate on video games is so worth it to me that, you know, I would say just don't be afraid to pay up. Don't be afraid to pay up. I, I can't think of a product where the sell through rate is better because even in my challenge with my second eBay store that a couple people have found it, but no, I've just asked people politely not to buy from that if they if they see it on on my if they find it. But all those video games sold same day, like within 24 hours. I had no viewer sales, five total feedback on that store, and I priced I priced things slightly below market value. Like my um, not as low as those Brooks shoes. Drew was mad at me for selling my Brooks shoes for 15 bucks on Poshmark, um, but like the, I had a. Um, <laughs> like a Mario Kart or a, a Wii, Wii Sports Resort bundle with the black controller and joystick. And I probably could have got like 40, 45 free shipping, but I sold it for 35 free shipping. So like I wasn't selling it for $15, you know, it's just slightly below. So if you have a new store, you probably do have to come in slightly under market value if you want to move stuff. Like with video games, honestly, I could have just listed stuff at market value and it probably would have sold within a week. Like because I listed it under market value slightly, maybe like 10%. That's why it sold within a day. But with stuff like that, as long as you don't have like a really bad rating on Facebook or on eBay, even if you don't have any feedback, I bet that stuff would still sell just because it's desirable. It's like it, Mario Kart for the Nintendo Wii sells hundreds of times every single day. Like you, that's the stuff you want to look for when you start yeah. out. Like and it's so crazy because I'll see people that are like, you know, reselling on eBay and they list 
you know, old troll doll or a, a precious moments angel figurine with a broken wing. And they wonder why it doesn't sell. And they've got a Nintendo Wii sitting in the under, you know, in, in some cupboard that they haven't used in five years, just sitting there with a copy of, you know, NCAA 2014 or you know, something, just something crazy. I'm like, stop <laughs> focusing on like the junk, like just because you like, oh, I paid a hundred dollars for this precious moments figurine. That doesn't matter. Like the, the price of acquisition has no effect on the market value of the item currently. That that goes true for what you paid retail right. for years ago. That goes true for what you pay for it now in a thrift store. Just yesterday, I picked up a copy of Mario Party 7 for Nintendo uh, a GameCube for 75 cents. But that doesn't mean it's not worth $50, you know? Just the same as if I would have paid $100 for it, it would still be worth I'm 50 still, I'm still salty about that pickup. That was good, man. I, I wasn't even supposed to go thrifting yesterday. I'm still salty. It was good. And then <laughs> if you guys don't follow me on Instagram. I'm glad you got the empty cases. Yeah. It, she literally, I was like, I'll just leave them. And, and I was like, ah, let me just ask. And I showed it to her. She was like the cashier that's always there. I was like, these are empty. She's like, well, if they're empty, you can just have them, I reckon. I'm like, uh, sounds good to me. I think video <laughs> games are supposed to be $1.99, but she rang it up DVD price. So I paid 75 cents for Mario Party 7 with the case and manual. And then two Super Smash Brothers Brawl and Nintendo GameCube cases and like a Crash Bandicoot case, Melee, melee whatever. Um, I mean, I probably have like 40, 50 bucks if just it's, in case. If it's Melee for the... If it's melee for the GameCube, then yeah, the case itself sells for about twenty bucks plus shipping, and I'm pretty sure you got two yeah, of those, two, right? Two of those, yeah, yeah. So it's crazy. That's my, that's my that's fear, insane. My, but my FOMO, man, my fear of missing out. Like I wasn't supposed to go thrifting yesterday. I was just listing, but I listed, I don't know, like twenty five or twenty six golf clubs yesterday. I cleaned like fifty or sixty of them, then had to go to the post office. I'm like, well, if I'm at the post office, I might as well go to Salvation Army because it's like right here, and then you know, mm -hmm. paid seventy five cents for probably over a hundred dollars in profit you know that's tough that's sometimes sometimes it's good to use like a reward system for example like you just said if i clean 25 golf clubs and i list 25 golf clubs this is one of the things that daily refinement talks about that i actually really like about his content is i don't know how him and tekken sports because i don't listen to them every single day how they do a 200 listings a day by themselves and clean stuff and ship and do all this but one of the things that chris has talked about multiple times is um nobody can just sit and list for eight hours a day without stopping and he talks about like yeah. um power listing like you power list for an hour and then you take a 20 minute break and reward yourself. You go get a smoothie or you go for a walk around your neighborhood, get your blood flowing, and then you come back and do it again. My my strategy is usually, you know, list at night as long as I can until I'm so tired that I fall asleep because I, I'm the most productive yeah. late at night when my whole family is sleeping. But when you I did that, what day did I do that? I can't remember, but I did do that the other day where I was listing during the day and my wife was gone with the kids. She normally will do something with them during the day. Uh, either they're playing in the backyard or they go to SeaWorld or to Disney or something like that. Um, and so I was like, all right, I got to drop off a couple packages because I missed my mail lady. So I'm going to go to the post office and then I'm going to stop at the Goodwill on the way back. I didn't find anything, but just the fact that I got out of the house, got some fresh air, you know, did something and just kind of like broke the the what you call it whatever everybody hates listing except me apparently but you know broke the that monotony. chain of yeah the monotony of listing you know it felt good to just get in my car get out go you know drop them off and then come back and then I felt a little more refreshed like all right I'm ready to go I'm ready to get this done you know got me a nice ice cold Gatorade you know or something like that and then you just get back to it so you know Ryan Ryan from Rally Roots has said multiple times when they first started making YouTube videos and when they first started reselling, they didn't have anybody to refer to, you know, him and Bonafide Hustler, Rockstar Flipper, Rake and Profit, like all kind of started around the same time. So they didn't have any videos to refer yeah. to. Now, there's probably thousands of reselling channels that people can refer to. And mm -hmm. whether you are a smaller channel or a bigger channel, if you're listening to this, I mean, everybody has content that you can learn from of some sort it's just a matter of how you're putting out your videos how you're editing how consistent you are and how long you've been doing it will determine your growth on youtube but 
people will find someone like Harry Tornado faster than they will a uh, profit monsters because of the amount of following it has already. So, but the point is, is that there's always something to learn. I've learned stuff from some of the smallest channels. Um, like for example, Hyphy Gold Topher, he's got he's got a smaller channel right now, but he's got amazing content. He goes to these like New York street sales. I, I don't know. He just like walks out of his apartment and there's like garage sales on the side of the sidewalk of his right outside his house. And he's always sharing cool wow. stuff that he picks up. And I, I learned a lot from from watching him. And he he even like the way that he negotiates and 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 uh, looks at stuff is very intriguing to me. Um, but you can learn from just about anybody. And I would say if you're struggling with that, just consume content until you find somebody that you like, you know, and then stick with that person yep. and learn as much as you can from them. Everybody's personality is different for for everybody. I may be too, too, let's go, you know, too happy go lucky for someone <laughs> where someone just really wants the chill rally roots factor where it's like, yep, here's some keen sandals. They're five ninety nine and these will sell for twenty five dollars, like just straight to the point rally roots style. So find someone you like stick, you know, stick with them, consume a lot of content and make money. Joey. So so Joe, Joey, um. You shared the other day that that lady commented and said uh, something about your let's go. She's like, I get it. that That's like your thing. Yeah. And you want to and, and you, you know, but she's like, I think you're better than that. I think you can like, I think people will like enjoy your channel without the let's go every 30 seconds. What do, what do you think about that? What are your thoughts? I personally think like, I appreciate the comment. First of all, um, it makes you like look at your, your YouTube channel and, um, analyze it and see like if i am saying it too much um but that's really just me like i can't stop being me you know what i mean um i just i i make my videos and that's my video and i i watch my video and i love it because i just love me like i just enjoy watching what i you know create um yeah I personally do think I say let's go a lot. And my dad's always said, Joey, calm down. Like what? Like even before YouTube, like I I've said this since I'm little, like, let's go, baby. Like, that's just me. I've been saying that since I'm born, like out of the womb, probably my first words. Let's go. <laughs> um, but it's just like, but it's cool because it's like my little trademark right now. Like everyone knows to say let's go when when they're around me. So um, now I'm actually going to try to trademark that phrase and then I'm going to charge <laughs> you like $5 every time you say it. <laughs> oh, but you know, I, I, I just, first of all, like to that lady, I appreciate the comment and it, you know, it, it makes you really look at my channel, but I'm still going to be me. I, I, it's not that I don't care about what you said, but I have to be me because then I'll psychologically be like, ah, you know, but then like, I'm not talking, I'm not being myself. And I, I talk in my head a lot and I overthink. So. I yeah. just have to be myself and I can't let people tell me what to do just because one person said it, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's like finding the balance between like, you know, taking constructive criticism because right. I mean, people have given me like left comments on my videos. I, I can't think of an example, but like tell me something that they like or don't like. And I'm like, oh, especially if it's multiple people, if multiple people say the same thing, I'm like, OK, right. let me look further into this and see. You know, because you, you want to maintain authentic, auth authenticity, make sure you're mm -hmm. you not just being fake for YouTube, but you can also take constructive criticism sometimes. Um, I, I love your channel so much. <laughs> it, jo Josh, Josh wants constructive criticism, but when the people say we want more Mo's and he doesn't give it to <laughs> us, the people are going to start to revolt. There's this guy that's so, been commenting but, on my videos like day one of asking for a Mo's only vlog. Day two of asking for a Mo's <laughs> only. I'm like... I can't make an entire video just Mo's like, uh, but I guess he's you should just going. strap. You should just strap a go. You know, Martin and Christina from thrift store gold, they did that one time where they did a video where they strapped a GoPro to their dog Finn and they just did a time lapse of him like running around the yard with the GoPro on. And it was like, everybody went crazy. Their viewers at the time were going crazy because they're like, we love Finn uh, because they put Finn in all of their videos. Um, like letting him out, yeah. you know, to, to into the yard or whatever. And like everybody was so happy when they made that video because Finn is just a crazy dog. He's like running around and, you know, um, but uh, it would be so cool if you could people just like animals, do. Man. 
Yeah, people people just like seeing that normal human aspect <laughs> of reselling too, because you can be the biggest reseller, the the most sales, whatever. But when you're relatable, because you have a wife, a kid, a dog, something that other people have, that, and then people say, "Oh, I have a golden lab," or "I had a golden lab growing up," or "I've always wanted a dog," and then you know they see how how happy you are, like "Love you so much," you know, and you. you you give them a hug or whatever, yeah. or you they see them laying in the, you, the background of your live stream. You yeah. hit him in the so, head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, it's. So but I had I had a lady. I don't. I don't go ahead. Go ahead. I, I don't understand it completely. Something with the psychological aspect of like having animals, like Pete um, Craigslist Hunter. I always refer to him as the guy with the parrot. You know, because I love. I love his parrot because he, he's like a dog almost. He's like, you know, patting him on the head and like, <laughs> it's yeah, crazy. And that's something really unique, you know? And then he had um, his old cat that passed away at like Milo. Is that what his name? Yeah. Yeah. Milo. Um, but yeah. I mean, and then he got Mo's in they, almost every video I can, you know, Ryan and Allie have Mochi and I don't zero. know the other ones. Zero. Yeah. I think Mochi. Yeah. I remember yeah zero, zero and Mochi. Zero and Mochi. Um, but yeah, animal. you should just do you should just do one of those clips where you're in the literally in the middle of thrifting and you just do like a freeze frame <laughs> and you're like, stop time to take Moe's for a walk. And like literally in the middle of your sourcing trip, just go to a clip of you walking Moe's up and down the street and play that music. That's like the the what's it called? Like that circus clown music. It's like just like up like an up and down an up and down time lapse on like 50 times fast and then back to thrifting <laughs> people would go crazy they would comment like no tomorrow <laughs> it, no matter what be, i mean people just love... yeah women and dogs but... women and dogs perform well in my in my video with Haley, like the thumbnail was like me Haley, and mose and somebody commented on they're like as a as a listener of triple thrift podcast and your last episode i know what you're trying to do with that thumbnail and it worked or something like because we had this episode about how women and thumbnails get more views yeah he's like i know what you're yeah. doing <laughs> i had i had a couple people comment one time well multiple times on my videos and tell me that i should stop saying peace money at the end of my videos because it's not me they say like the peace money thing doesn't make sense to me because it, it it's not you. It doesn't match the rest of your videos. You should stop saying that or I'm, I get really annoyed with that. And I find that interesting because when you get new subscribers, for the most part, new subscribers aren't going to go back and watch all of your previous videos. You know, they're going to watch yeah. from the, the video that they find and then moving forward, which is why YouTube is kind of an interesting beast because you could put out a really good video and then the next video isn't anything related to the last video you made. You know, you could make a what sold video and then you could make a, a flea market video and someone has no attachment to flea markets because they've never been, they don't like them, they think they're dirty or whatever, and they're never going to go yeah. back and watch any previous videos. And the peace money thing came from my son, Asher. We were... We were trying to come up with something, a funny outro for our videos. And I said, peace out. And then he said, peace money or something like that. But he said it so <laughs> silly. He was like, I think three at the time. So he's obviously a lot younger. And he was like, peace mm -hmm. money, you know, little kids. <laughs> and the way he said it, I was like, that's it. I'm doing it. And so I just started saying peace money. And it's kind of just like a, a way that I can connect with my son Asher through my videos. If you watch the end of my videos, whenever he's in one, I get him to say it. Or if I'm coming home and I'm showing a thrift haul or something and I'm in the house going, well, that's the end of the video, guys. Asher, say peace money. And he, you just see him like his, his face just lights up when I ask him to say it. Um, mm -hmm. Luckily for my viewers, it's the last six seconds of my video. So they can just skip that part Most of the video right at the end. <laughs> Dude, I've had uh, it, it's all about like I said, maintaining your authenticity like you, and you're never going to please everybody like with my new channel intro. Um, most people like it like I've gotten a lot of positive comments, but of course, a couple of people are like, oh, it's I like the old song better. I like the old intro better. I'm like, well, I appreciate the feedback, but anytime anybody changes anything from what they've been doing for a long period of time, there's always going to be people that like the old one better 
or like, I'm not a fan of that. Like it's any, anytime you involve more than like three people in a decision, there's going to be at least one of them that doesn't like it, you know, <laughs> much less almost a hundred thousand people on YouTube. Um, so it's, you know, like my intro, I like it. And that's honestly all that matters. As long as it's not like, you know, if, if I, if I made a new intro and like a lot of the people in the comment section were like, Oh, I don't like this. This is terrible. Like, please, please, Josh, this is not you. This, you know, then I might revisit it. Um, but when it's like, you know, for every hundred people that like it, three don't, you know, that's just kind of like just going to happen no matter what it is, you know? Mm. So, Like your, your ending song, like, or the ending, like music is, it's so catchy now. Like I'm so used to it. Like before I was like, no, nah, man, I need it back. I need your old song back. And I didn't want to say that to you, but now I'm like, you get used to it. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. And I've changed. It. No, I think, I think the country, I think the country song where you were like, hello, USPS, the best. I'm going to need a lot of mailing tubes down or whatever it was. Dude, it was so perfect. That's not, country. that was the best outro I've dude, ever I, seen. I swear. Like I, I messaged Josh like instantly. I was like, dude, that was the best part of the whole video. <laughs> so I, 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 I literally spend so much time finding songs for my videos. Like I, I use epidemic sound. It's a great platform, but it's just, they have hundreds of thousands of songs. So it's just hard to like find one that I like. And I was listening for songs to like add over, you know, in the middle of the video in the background. And I heard that one and it was like a, I wouldn't call it country. It's like a ukulele with like a, like a trap beat to it or something. I really like it. It's like, you know, basic chord progressions. And then right before the beat drops, there's a pause. I'm like, dude, I could use that as my new outro because I end yeah. I end all my videos the same. Like, thank you so much for watching. You're the best, and I'll catch you on the next one. So I have like the beat stop, like the, the <laughs> ukulele stop, and when I, right when I say catch you, and then it's nothing, and it says on the next one, and then right when my hand hits the lens, that's when the beat drops again. I, but in that video, you guys are talking about after my hand hit the lens, it was black screen, and then I did the USPS thing, and then right after that, the beat dropped. So I was I was very happy with that video. That was def that was definitely a good one. But speaking speaking of your videos, I don't know how much time we have left, but let's just talk about this for a second cuz I don't think anybody has really given you the opportunity to talk about it. So, let's let's let you brag for a minute. What does it feel like having almost 100,000 subscribers? And don't don't be so don't be stingy. Don't be stingy on the truth like what does it feel yeah, like yeah. knowing that you have an audience of almost 100,000 people watching you, listening to you, commenting, learning from you? How, you know, how does that make you feel when you, you know, wake up or just all of it? I have so many questions about it, but you know, I have 7,000 subscribers. I can't imagine the pressure of almost 100,000 people. I, th I think the biggest thing to remember is that everything is relative. There's people that have YouTube channels with 30 subscribers and they're like, man, I wonder what, how Drew feels with 7,000 subscribers. Right. Like that's crazy. 7,000 people, you know? So it's all relative. Like I remember if you go back and watch my reseller review with rally roots, they had like, I think they were right about a hundred thousand subs. Like I remember I interviewed them about the same time as the, um, the wall street journal did for that video for them. So I think they were just under a hundred thousand, almost where I am now. And I was like a little kid and I was like, Oh my gosh, you guys are like, what is it like? Like, do you get recognized all the time? Like, do you ever get stalkers? Like, it's so weird. Like I was giddy because at the time I had like, I don't know, like 2000 subscribers. But now that I'm basically in their shoes where they were now, I'm like, Oh, it's, it's kind of doesn't really, it, it's just such a slow progression. You know, like if you, I don't know, like if you get a shout out from Mr. Beast or something in his um, in the end of the year video, he shouted out like four channels and one guy went from like 80 subs to like that was so cool thousand, when he did you know? that. So if it's like a really fast transition overnight, then, yeah, it's like mind blowing, you know, but this has been consistent growth over the course of two years. So it's like it's not something I just wake up like surprised to like I, I put a lot of time and effort into my videos. I try to make them entertaining and helpful and concise, you know, and, and so I, I'm not surprised that I've, that I've grown to the level that I have, but I, I mean, I don't want to sound like ungrateful. It's just like, if you are, I feel like I'm good at YouTube. I feel like it's like a natural passion for me. And anytime I have a natural passion, I'm tend, I tend to be good at things. Um, so it's like subscribers are a 
symptom of providing quality content that either is helpful or entertaining. So I feel like my content is helpful and entertaining. So, you know, naturally the subscribers are going to come. Um, but again, it's not, um, I feel like more of a level of responsibility than like, you know, I'm not like, I don't know. Some people are like, oh, you're, uh, they meet me at dream deals or something like, oh, you're like a celebrity. I'm like, nah, not really. Like, it's very like the only place I ever get recognized is either thrift stores or dream deals. I've never, I did get recognized in the grocery store one time, the guy stocking the Pepsis. He was like, yo, Harry Tornado. I was like, what's up, man? <laughs> Love you so much. So that's, that's the only time <laughs> I've ever been recognized outside of a thrift store. Um, I mean, and it's cool. Like I, I, it's, it's interesting, you know, people that buy stuff from my store and ask for my autograph on a card or something like that. So it, it's been like weird to get used to because I'm just some dude in South Carolina, you know, some college dropout that, you know, two years ago was working at, in a cubicle at an insurance agency, you know, like who, who would want my autograph? But again, it's not something that's happened overnight. It's been the result of two years of, of hard work. Um, so it, it's, it's awesome. But again, it's more of a sense of responsibility to make sure what I say in a video is accurate, make sure I'm not giving bad advice, make sure I'm consistently putting out content, make sure, you know, if I accept a, a brand deal or something, make sure it's a good quality product. Um, it's, it's more of a responsibility than like a, Hey, look at, look at me. I've got a hundred thousand subscribers. I have, I have one, one main question for you. And that would be, do you feel a major responsibility about having to upload content? I'm sure at this point in the game, you obviously enjoy making the content or you wouldn't do it. But, you know, when we talk about like mental health, for example, a lot of people can get burnt out from reselling, can get burnt out from making YouTube videos. You know, does the pressure of feeling like because you have such a big audience that you have to constantly put out YouTube videos play in the back of your mind and you just think, oh, I wish I could just take a day off or a week off from making videos just to go back to my old self before YouTube where I didn't have that pressure and responsibility. Like I know you enjoy making mm -hmm. them obviously, but um, does that play in your mind at all? Or are you kind of so deep into the passion and love for making YouTube that you wouldn't change it, I guess, if that makes sense. Like for me, sometimes I get to a point where I'm so focused on reselling and listing and sourcing that I say, well, if I have time to edit a YouTube video, I will do it. But I don't feel the responsibility that I have to put out a video every other day or my viewers are going to leave me. Yeah, I, I, I don't um, I don't really worry about it that much. Like back in October, I took like a week off. Um, and that was coming off a really like September at the time, September was my highest grossing month ever on YouTube. So like it felt weird coming off of a really high month. And then the first week in October, just taking a week off, didn't make a single video for seven days. Um, but still October, I still made almost as much as I did in September, even with a week off. Um, but also, like you said, I really enjoy it. You know, it's like, I, I really think people are just born to be entrepreneur. Like if you were a natural born entrepreneur, you enjoy building a business so much that it never, you might get tired and you might need to sleep, but you never get like overwhelmed. Honestly, the only thing that really overwhelms me is my emails. Like I hate responding to emails and I have so many of them and I feel terrible, but I'm like, you know, I have to actually type it out. And some people just ask me questions that are just so in depth, like, or just so vague that just require such a long response. And that's, that's the only aspect of my business that I don't enjoy. Um, I love making YouTube videos. I'm going to make one today. I'm going to probably make another one, you know, Monday and then Wednesday. And I, like, I'm just, I'm pumped about it. Um, but I never feel pressured. I've had like, I'll post a video. I think I posted a video last Thursday and then somebody messaged me like Sunday morning and they're like, Hey man, are you okay? I haven't seen a video from you in a while. I'm like, I just, I just posted <laughs> like, Thursday it's been night. two days. <laughs> so it's cool that people are like, you know, I, it, I could post videos every day. And people would watch them, but I'm not, I'm not pressured to post. Um, I mean, I'm incentivized, obviously. I mean, I'm, my wife doesn't want me to talk about YouTube or like total income anymore, but I make a lot of money on YouTube. So it's not only do I enjoy making the videos, I enjoy editing them. Yeah. There's I enjoy a benefit. Talking to my audience. Yeah. Like, and like, it's not in the beginning, if you're starting a YouTube channel and you're trying to stay consistent and upload two to three videos a week and each one's getting 
you know, 10 to 20, 30 views, you're not seeing any growth. That's when it's hard. But for me, I'm just in this really blessed situation where I can continually enjoy the process of creating content, continually get rewarded by, you know, new subscribers and new friends. I mean, I met you guys through YouTube and, and really good money for my family. So it's, it's never been, it's never been overwhelming except the emails. That's so Joey, that's so awesome because, you know, I, I want that too, like so bad, like there's nobody wants it more than me. And, you know, taking these two weeks off is going to prove to me if, you know, I have what it takes to, I mean, I Did know it's not say enough that? time. Did you say that? Did you tell everybody that you're taking two weeks off? I said it on the podcast, yeah. but I haven't made a video about it. Cause I'm going to make a video today, obviously, but, okay. um, you know, I, I'm, I just want to start it off. Like I want to like put on my mailman clothes and just run to my car and just be like super excited to do this. Cause like YouTube is like my passion and just to be at, mm -hmm. I have 3,482 subscribers. Like, you know, it's, it's just so awesome to know that, that there's a following that wants to watch me. And I think someone asked me the other day, like, how do you feel about having like 3000 something subscribers? And I'm just, you know, I'm blessed to have those people. And I don't, I don't care if I had a hundred thousand or a million, I'm just so thankful th for what I have. And especially going live on Mondays, like where I connect with my viewers and how it's growing mm -hmm. so much and how, how other people don't go live and to talk to their people. And I know people say, or even respond to comments. Like there's huge channels yeah. where they like blatantly admit that they don't respond to comments. Yeah. I'm like, I mean, even if you, that's why you haven't hit a hundred K subs yet. Yeah, man. Like, people enjoy engaging with creators that they love. Yeah. And just like, just imagine like, like, I mean, me and drew, like we, you know, we want it like bad, but like just seeing you as a friend, like knowing the process and hearing it, like just sitting here and just, analyzing what you're talking about gives me the goosebumps because that's all I want. You know, it's not about the, yeah. you know, people like my dad says, and I know he's going to be listening to this. Shout out to you, dad. You know, he says it's, it's, it's about the money, Joey, you know, it's gotta be something about the money. And it's just like, for me, like, I don't even care. It's something that I love. Like I have a passion for this. It's not yeah. like for me to wake up knowing that I have two weeks off. I am pumped, dude. Like, let's go, dude. Like, I, I want this so bad. Like I want to cry because it's just like, I, I, I don't know what to do with these two weeks. Like, you know, I just want to make content and just be myself, you know, Joe, Joe's like going to get nothing done in two right? weeks just cause he's so excited. I know. Like, that's what I think. Like <laughs> you're going to wake up and your two week vacations over and you're like, ah, all I did was just, I couldn't stop thinking about yeah. all the possibilities. <laughs> no, no, that's, you know, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, no, I got to get off of here and work hard and you know it, it's my dream man and i gotta do it i gotta do it for my people yeah. bro you know so it, it's just i mean like it, it's definitely you definitely do have a passion for it but um i don't want to sound like too much of a, of a dad but you do have to figure out a way to to monetize it yeah you know like there's people that you can have a passion for anything you can have a passion for making clay sculptures you know mm -hmm. but you can't you got to feed your family too of course you know? yeah um, i had a, a friend of mine that went to a private college for an art degree and uh i, I mean it was like 30 grand a year for an art degree so she's you know over a hundred thousand dollars in debt for this and i think somebody's at my door hopefully that's nobody important um over a hundred thousand dollars in art degree and now she's working at like a retail store making like you know 10 bucks an hour and I'm like, you gotta, you gotta do something. You've got to start a TikTok. You've got to start a YouTube channel. You've got to start a podcast, something. There's people out there that are interested in art and like, want to see like th this one girl following TikTok. She's a full-time artist and she'll has a TikTok with like over, I think two or 3 million followers. So she'll do a painting, make a TikTok about it and sell prints of that painting and sell stickers. And she's making really good money. But if it wasn't for the social media aspect of it and like building that audience, there's just only so many people that would buy your art. You know, you've got to get your name out there somehow. So I think YouTube is a great way to monetize passions in life that wouldn't necessarily have another outlet for monetization. Otherwise, you know, with artists and resell, I mean, you can make money reselling, but like you could significantly increase your money with reselling if you incorporate, you know, a successful YouTube channel in with that. Um, so definitely 
passion with a plan for monetization is the key to a happy life, I think. Mm -hmm. I think I think one of the things about YouTube that a lot of people don't like to talk about or are scared to talk about because they don't want to offend their audience, which is a weird psychological aspect of YouTube to me is the whole monetization thing, because I was telling Joey this on the phone the other day. We talk a lot on the phone, especially when he's on his route. Like if I'm doing my shipping, I put my AirPods in and I call Joey and we just talk about reselling or something like that sometimes. But um, one of the things I was telling him is so many people kind of try to hide the monetization side of YouTube, but it's just known that YouTubers can make good money. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that um, as long as you're not bragging and boasting about it. But I don't think that anybody, I would say at least nine out of 10 people start making YouTube channels knowing that there's a possibility that they can make a lot of money on it. And I think that that's in the back of every YouTuber's mind, whether it's big or small, and that can affect how you make your videos mm -hmm. and how you run your channel if you're driven by the money or if you're driven by the passion. But I think everybody thinks about going, nobody says, I'm just going to make YouTube videos because I want to spend hours and hours and hours, just for I want to spend 40 hours a week like Josh to make no money. People think about, well, if I put in the time, I'm going to make money from last video. Just, just the third video in the starting from zero, zero series, like the filming, the editing, and like all the work was almost 40 hours just in that one video. And hopefully it'll make you know enough money to make that worth it. But the the whole point of this challenge, I, I mean, I could make a the thrifting video with Haley. That, that was just us going to thrift stores, carrying my GoPro. I mean, it took, it was just filming was just hanging out with her and it took me 45 minutes to edit. And that video has got 22,000 views. So it's probably made 250 bucks. Whereas the next video that took 40 hours, you know, and it'll probably make about the same amount of money unless it, the series goes viral or something. So it's, it's, but, but the starting from zero challenge series was, I knew going into it, it was going to take a ton of time and a ton of work, but I'm seeing so many people comment on those videos saying that I love this series so much. This is putting it into perspective. You're showing how anybody can do this. Like you're hustling, you're taking YouTube and Instagram audience out of this to go back to like the basics of reselling. I love it so much. So I feel like that the helping my audience aspect of this starting from zero challenge series is the benefit. Whereas like the smaller, shorter, easy to make vlogs is just like, okay, I'll just sprinkle some of these in to, you know, help pad the financial numbers. Um, but yeah, like you said, right. any, I, I, there's, if, as long as people don't lie and like, you know, be honest with themselves, everybody who has a YouTube channel cares about the money, like the, the money. It, it, right. It, yeah. There's just way too much time and effort that go it's, into it's in making videos to not want to get reimbursed for your time and effort. Right. And like, like I said, there are some that overthink it and they're driven by the money versus driven by the passion, which is why I think your channel has done so well, because you're reaping the benefits of your hard work and your editing skills and the time that you put in, you know, but there, if there's anybody that says, I don't make YouTube videos, I don't care about the money. I, I think that they don't mean it necessarily that they don't care about the money, but it's kind of like when, when people are live and then you get a super chat. Everybody always says things like, you don't have to super chat me. Thank you so much. You know, but in the back of my mind, I think every YouTuber says or thinks this is just me thinking out loud. This may not be everybody, mm -hmm. but I think everybody thinks it would be nice to get a couple of super chats if I go live today. We don't want people I'll, I'll to just give podcast. us their I'm money. I'm probably going to go live today. I'm probably going to go live today, Friday, because I feel like Friday is a good time to go live. People, if they're working, maybe they're you know slacking off a little bit because it's coming up to the weekend. So I feel like Friday afternoons are a good time to go live. You know, it, and I'm like, okay, I'll take two hours out of my day to go live, answer questions, help people, you know, give, you know, I, I don't really want to do channel or eBay store reviews anymore, but answer questions, you know, hang out, build that relationship with my audience. And I fully expect to make, you know, at least 50 to a hundred dollars in super chats, not because like, I don't want to say expect, but like given my history, like I don't remember the last time I did a live stream where I didn't make about that much in super chats. That's just part of doing a live stream. Um, when right. I was building, my channel, and there's, there's, Sorry, go ahead. 
I was just going to say, uh, just to everybody listening, there's 100% nothing wrong with that. I just think it's an aspect of YouTube, which is why we have this podcast that nobody talks about, that people go live and love to get super chats. But, mm -hmm. you know, people say things like, you don't have to do that. Please, please stop sending super chats. It, <laughs> in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, I'm saying that because... I don't want people to feel obligated to send me money, but it's so nice. It's like when you get birthday cards, you know, when you're a kid and all yeah. your friends come to your birthday party and give you money. Like you don't, you, you just want to hang out with your friends at your birthday party at, you know, at the playground. But when you open your card and you get a $5 bill from your friend, you're like, yes, you know, it's kind of like <laughs> yeah. that side of it is there's, there's no better feeling polite, than knowing like... that someone, what's that? I was, it's just like being polite, you know, like when I get to, I, I say like, you guys don't have to super chat because there's been some people in the past that think that I don't answer questions unless you, you know, follow me on Patreon for that one month that I had a Patreon that failed and never funded everybody or Harry Tornado doesn't answer questions unless you super chat him. I'm like, the only time that super chats, like, I don't know, I, I don't want to have a live stream where I'm only talking to people that super chat. Obviously, I'm going to, if somebody pays me money obviously I'm going to go out of my way to answer their question. But I also try to like in between the super chats, try to answer questions from people that haven't paid as well. Cause I don't, I'm not trying to insinuate that you have to give me a super chat to answer your question alive. But I'm saying that if I spend two hours of my day answering questions consistently, and then somebody gives me a four ninety nine super chat, that's not surprising. You know, I I've, I give super chats all the time, like, cause it's a tax write off. I just write it off as marketing or advertising. But if I'm on a channel, um, you know, when I was building my channel, I would super chat all the time because, you know, if, uh, I remember Lindy Glenn was live one time. She had like 50K subs at one time. So I gave her like a $10 super chat and said, how did you get to 50,000 subscribers? And then everybody saw my name on the screen and she talked for five minutes about how to build a YouTube channel. So it got my name out there for 10 bucks. She right. probably had, you know, 200 people in the live stream. And I did that on Rally Roots lives when they did it. I did it on... um the reseller morning show with John and Lonnie and, and Justin, I, I I probably gave that show three, $400 in super chats over the course of like three months, you know, but everybody saw my name constantly. Every time there was a big live, a big YouTuber on a live video, I was in there with a super chat. Usually now I can't, I probably spent, I probably spent almost a thousand dollars on super chats in the first like six months of building my YouTube channel because it was just marketing. It was just getting my name out there. Yeah, I think, I think that's, and it was helping the, the YouTube creator. Yeah, I think that there's a there's a benefit to both sides of it, which is why I said there's nothing wrong with it. But you know, there there's just a weird psychological aspect to me that I just have no problem talking about personally. Like if I go live, which I barely ever go live because I'm usually live on Joey's channel every Monday, and then I just am so busy working myself that I don't really go live much myself. But if I ever went live, like I get pumped when I get a super chat and I'm like, yo, let's go 299 super chat. Thank you so much. Like I really enjoy the fact that somebody values my content enough to drop me $3 or $5 or $10. But I try not to be that person that says at this point, I try not to be the person yeah. that's like, you know, please don't send me money. Please don't send me money because then people are going to start to think that I'm reverse trying to use reverse psychology and say please don't send me money but really in reality what i'm trying to say is send me money you know and and i think that that is where those can go wrong is yeah. just to be honest and upfront about it like everybody enjoys getting super chats and everybody thinks about it when they go live oh it's nice to get some super chats while i'm live so yeah you know but that one time that i went live with joey that one time i went live with joey really and he nice, got yeah. like five hundred dollars in super chats we were we were freaking out because it wasn't just like one three dollar super chat it was like and that was enjoyable from the viewer standpoint like the, the people watching that enjoyed seeing joey get so much money you know like i remember on um, anfisa she shared it to her instagram store she's like this is crazy let's go and she wasn't even getting money she was just enjoying the, the yeah. process like, dude, I'm telling you, as long, if people are honest with themselves, everybody would love to get a super chat, like 100%. Again, as long as you're not like forcing people to pay for your time and you're like, I'm only going to answer your question if you give me a super chat, then you're just being a douchebag. But 
I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. I enjoy getting super chats. It's awesome. It's a, it's an incentive for taking hours out of my day to answer questions. Joey. When Joey's dad walked in with the live super chat. I remember the hundred dollars, <laughs> baby. That was awesome. Yeah. No Game fees changer. Either. No YouTube person. Um, changer. No fees. <laughs> It was, that was awesome. But before we get off here, I have a surprise for both of you Ooh. and for me. My parents um, wanted to give it to us, so I'm going to be shipping something out to both of you. Um, and the next podcast, we can uh, we can go over it. I'm so excited! <laughs> All right. So, Joey, did you want to did you want to say anything to just about like being live? Because I know that we go live together on <laughs> Mondays, and sometimes we've gotten up to like 200 people yeah. listing on ebay with us while we're doing it and uh i just think yeah. that's so cool that you know you've you've grown that audience organically because you've been so consistent with every single week just listing and you've brought me into it and you yeah. know i had I, I dressed up as abraham lincoln last week yeah. for president's day on our live listing if you haven't seen that just go back and watch a couple minutes of the replay or the whole thing if you need to get some listing done but that was so much fun. Like I enjoy doing stuff like that for the audience, for the people, you know, spent, spent a little bit of money on a, on an outfit and then dressed up like Abraham Lincoln. And I, I even surprised Joey. I caught him off guard. So. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. It's, it's just a true blessing of what we've grown or, you know, what I've grown to be something that, people come to me on the, my DMS on Instagram and say, this is my new routine every Monday night at 9 PM till whatever, you know, how, whenever I get off, that's what I'm doing. I'm listing with you. Like you've given me the motivation to get stuff done. Like that's the whole intention of this is getting stuff listed, um, getting pumped up. You know, you're going to be making some money. Like that's the best part about selling stuff on eBay is, you know, being on my live. Like I, I just enjoy doing it. Um, I just love talking to the viewers. That's that's what I've what yeah. I've always wanted for me because when I when I see my other YouTubers that I watch like before you got or before reselling, you know, they never go live. They never talk to their people. They never comment back. But it's you learn as you grow is that it's physically impossible to to even do that. But just to go live and just say thank you to everybody, that's awesome. Like to yeah. read someone's comment when like literally Josh, when you put the link in the chat like for me to go on mm -hmm. your channel, like I was ecstatic. Like, I'm like, he'll tell. never pick me. There's like 500 people in the chat. There's no way. Like, there's no way. See, and then like, once I was in there, I went nuts. Like, that, I mean, that. So, so I don't know of another YouTuber who would have done that because that, that's a big risk, you know, because I don't have like a sensor thing, you know, so anybody could join the chat and immediately start yelling racial slurs or something. And then, like, then I have to deal with the backlash of that. So it was a big risk. Yeah. But, I was like, you know, I don't think anybody's out to get me, you know, anything like that. So we can, let's just try it out and see what happens. And that was like, like I feel like is, that was a, who a is this photograph. Italian guy in the waiting room? Yeah. That's like when everybody realized like, who is this guy? I like his attitude. Let me go check out his channel. And that's like when you started your huge growth, growth spurt, man. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I, I think yeah. of that as like, like, I'm just like thankful to have Absolutely. you guys as friends, best friends. We were, we were talking oh before God. the podcast today about like real life friends and stuff and how internet friends are just so much better. <laughs> like, uh, all my real life friends are always busy, but I can just call Drew anytime or call Joey. Hey guys, can I, like, we were working on a, uh, I'm working on a video about how to celebrate a hundred K subs because you know, it, it's a, it's an achievement for sure. You know, like it's not something that should be. Everybody I know, like I remember Rally Roots didn't even open their plaque for like six months. I'm like, come on, man. Like, let's let's get excited here. And then Cincinnati Picker was just like, oh, this is yeah. pretty neat. All right. So we got four orders going out today. <laughs> I'm like, so I don't know. I want to make a, a dedicated <laughs> video like celebrating it. And I think Drew and Joey are going to be helping me with that in some in some capacity. Super excited about that. Let's go. <laughs> but anyway, we I are. Think, I think one of the reasons. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. The last thing I want to say is just I really enjoy having met you guys and I'm just so thankful for both of you and your opinions on my content, my my life, my videos, the friendship that we've established and I can't wait to see what the future holds for all of us. 
because I can't think of any of my friends that I would call and say, hey, so-and-so, do you want to just drive to South Carolina and go see a YouTuber with me? And Joey just being like, what? Yes, dude. And then he actually did it because I'm, <laughs> I'm the type of person that I'm like, you know what? If I want to go backpacking in Europe, I'm going to buy a plane ticket and go backpacking in Europe, you know? And I'm not going to talk about it. I'm yeah. going to do it. And the fact that we actually did it was just so awesome. And uh, um, that's just kind of like what started our, our our friendship is I drove to South Carolina with somebody I've never met before. My car broke down and, <laughs> you know, it was, just, it was just a crazy adventure. So I'm just thankful for both of you guys. Let's go, baby. I started the the triple friendship we have, which has become a podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening to episode 16 of the Triple Thrift Podcast. We love you so much, and we'll see you on the next one. See ya!